not that quartering. Too many people are already talking about that quartering. Assessing his channel and his character, debating whether he should have been assaulted. Ugh, too much. It's an assault. He needs to avail himself of legal remedies and let the courts decide. No, let's talk about quartering soldiers. No soldier shall, in time of peace, be quartered in any house without the consent of the owner, nor in time of war, but in a manner to be prescribed by law. The Third Amendment. The Prohibition Against Quartering Without Consent. No, not that quartering. Quarters are what soldiers call housing. To be quartered, therefore, means that the soldier is assigned a place to eat, sleep, and otherwise live while not on duty. The word quarter also shows up as a root for other military terms, headquarters, where the general, the head, lives and works, winter quarters, where the army stays during the years before the advent of modern warfare, even quartermasters, the soldiers charged with keeping the needs of the army supplied. Since quartering is about where soldiers sleep, then why was it so important that an entire amendment was necessary to address it? When our society discusses issues politely, with each side seeking a peaceful resolution, everyone benefits. When the discussion is a highly polarized shouting match between people who just don't listen to each other, well, it's time for some roasted opinions. When the United States was founded, the practice of quartering soldiers on private property was common. Remember that a democratic republic was a long-forgotten form of government at the time. Kings and nobles ruled, and to varying extents did as they wished. King George III was actually the ruler of a liberal kingdom. The UK had a parliament already and a prime minister who governed the British Empire in his name. It's for that reason more than any other that the American colonies had such a notion of independence. Honestly, if America had fallen into the hands of the French or the Spanish with their absolutist regimes, then it's much less likely that America would have fought for and gained independence at all. In one particular aspect, though, the king exercises royal prerogative. Since the colonies were all royally chartered by the time of the revolution, the royal army could and did seize the property of colonials for military use often without compensation. This was by no means uncommon practice at the time, especially among European kingdoms. Armies were getting bigger and they drew much of their supplies from the seizure of privately owned goods. This was because they could not gather together in one place. An army takes an enormous amount of supplies to support, and the transportation of those supplies is a problem. So armies do their best to live off of the land at this time. And that meant seizing the property of private citizens for the use of the army. When put that way, quartering becomes an issue of private property rights. The Continentals believed in the principle of natural rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Thomas Hobbes explained, even as the colonies were founded, that there were natural rights, the legal concept of just, the right to live that all people have and that natural rights have precedence over laws, lex, words which define, describe, and prohibit practices. Later, it was asserted that private property ownership is one of the natural rights, as explained so aptly by John Locke in his second treatise. Yes, that John Locke, the father of liberalism. His labor theory of property, value is given not by nature, but by effort expended, and the introduction of value grants ownership, was quite revolutionary and brilliant. Thomas Paine and Thomas Jefferson elaborated on these concepts, creating the framework of the social contract which still binds Americans together more than two centuries later. People have a right to live. Because they have a right to live, they have a right to liberty. Because they have a right to liberty, they have the right to pursue happiness. And because they have the right to pursue happiness, they have the right to own property. The laws of any nation must therefore protect those rights. They were not rights granted by charter. Paine explained that chartered rights could be revoked or modified, as happened in the American colonies repeatedly. But the government has the right to make use of whatever resources it deems necessary to defend the nation, right? 
Um, no. Just, no. National defense is important. Without the people in uniform who stand ready to defend the nation, its citizens, and the social contract which exists between nation and citizens, and among the citizens of that nation, the nation will swiftly fall to some less scrupulous person who is much less enlightened and much more armed. But, and this is key, the defense of the nation could not and did not take precedence over the rights of the citizens, including the right to own property. This philosophy regarding the natural right of property ownership provides an important framework for other constitutional concepts. The government does have the ability to seize ownership of property through the use of eminent domain, but eminent domain is strictly limited under constitutional law to be employed only when necessary to preserve and promote the public good. Property condemned under eminent domain must be appraised and the fair market value of that property must be paid. The concept of property was important enough in the American social contract that it became the most defining characteristic of the natural culture. Nuh uh, Roast. The defining characteristic is freedom. Actually, no. See, the biggest point of contention in America was over slavery. The states debated this concept during the Constitutional Convention, necessitating the Three Fifths Compromise in order to ensure ratification of the Constitution. The balance of political power in America between 1787 and 1861 was dominated by the debate over slavery. And in 1861, a four-year-long war began to decide, once and for all, the question of slavery. Thus, the first century of the United States was about whether people could be private property. Civil rights and the pursuit of those civil rights have been the primary sculptor of American culture ever since 1865, too. Even today, we debate on YouTube the right to own intellectual property under fair use. When seen from that perspective, I hope that you understand why an amendment which established the precedent that government need cannot trump private ownership, and that neither ownership nor even use can be taken against the will of the citizen without just cause and fair compensation is so important. It was pretty revolutionary concept at the time, and for me, it still is. Now that's just my opinion, and you don't have to agree with me. In fact, I'd love to hear what you think, so go ahead and give me a like or dislike and comment below. If you like this content and want to see more, feel free to subscribe and make sure that you ring the notification bell. New episodes of Roasted Opinions post on Wednesdays at 8pm and Saturdays at noon, Central Time. Join me on the last Saturday of every month for my live stream with a special guest who joins me in the kitchen. New content is coming. So watch this space.